Is on. All right. <clears throat> All right. So today, uh, the title of this message, if I could title it, is going to be "Let This Mind Be in You." And so, I'm just going to start with a prayer. Uh, Grace, Heavenly Father, Lord, has come to you in the name of your dear Son Jesus, Lord, and ask that you would anoint my lips uh, to speak what you have given me. Ask that you anoint the hearts and the minds to receive the word, Lord, that anything that's from me be moved out of the way, Lord, and that you would be glorified, you would be magnified, and that your name would be lifted up above every name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> so, uh, the first one I'm going to go is in Isaiah 9, uh, chapter, verse 6. It's uh, one of the most famous Christmas verses. It's one of my favorite verses. And... Uh, I just want to draw out two things from there. And it says, For unto us a child is born, and a child is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So yesterday we celebrated uh, the birth of our Lord. And as we can see from this scripture, uh, he wasn't just a child. He wasn't just a man. He was the everlasting father. He was the mighty God, taken on, clothed in human flesh. This is no mere man. This is Jesus. And this is the point I want to drive home before we get into the scripture text that I'm going to preach from, is that Jesus wasn't just a man, although he took on flesh. Jesus was, says in one John 1, verse 1 through 3, he was with God and he was God. And all things were created through him. And without him, nothing was made. So that's us. Nothing. Nothing you touch, nothing you can taste, nothing you can smell. Everything came through Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing about Jesus. Is he isn't just a man. He's a creator. Colossians 1.16 says, All things were made by him, through him, and for him. Nothing exists apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus is the reason why we're all here. We have to grasp this before we see what he did, how, how big of a condensation it was for him to come down from the king of glory into, into our creation. We have to realize it says that he made this creation and he came into it and they knew him not. And Hebrews 1.3 says he even right now as we speak upholds all things by the word of his power. This is Jesus. This is the Jesus who it says in my scripture, if you want to turn there, we're going to be going over Philippians 2, verses 5 through 9. <clears throat> I'll give you a chance to turn there. But this is the reason why I titled my message, Let This Mind Be In You. Because this is the command of scripture right here. <clears throat> it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This Christ Jesus, this creator, remember this, this is who we're talking about, the creator of all things, who upholds all things by the word of his power. No mere man, preexistent, had no beginning, will have no end. This Jesus, this is his mind. Let this be in you, let this be in me. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on a cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. So this is our text. Let this mind be in you. Now, we're always going out here talking about, give me a new mind, renewing our mind. And we want to, we want to talk about the scripture where it says, renew your mind. But renew it to what? Let this mind be in you. Humble yourself. In Philippians 2, 6, it says, Who being in the form of God, considered it not robbery to be equal with God. What is that saying right there? Some translations have it like this. Who considered it not a thing to be grasped, that he was equal with God. In other words, Jesus could have just been like, I created all, I created all this. Why am I going to go into this? Why am I going to go down there and stoop to my level or to their level for these people who have rebelled against me? These people who have turned on me, says who have all like sheep have went astray. Jesus could have said, I, that's beneath me and not, and been justified and been true and been right. But he considered it not robbery 
means he says, you know what? I'm not even going to consider that fact. I'm going anyway, and we're going to find out why. <clears throat> he did not say, because I'm God, I don't have to submit to your will to the Father. Jesus always submitted to the will of the Father. So the Father, the Word of God says that before the foundation of the earth, Jesus was the Lamb who was slain. The plan, to, the plan for Jesus to be going to the cross wasn't an accident. It was the will of the Father from the beginning. It was the will of the Father for me and you to save us for our salvation. And Jesus could have looked at the Father and said to the Father, we're the same. That's what it means when it says equal. Didn't consider being equal with God as a thing to be grasped. He wasn't like, I ain't going, you go. He could have. It's true. He said he's equal with God. He said, no, how about we just do this? He said, you know what, Father? I'm going. You said to go and I'm going. I'm not going to count my status as a reason not to be obedient to the Father. <clears throat> but he made himself of no reputation. We see in the book of Isaiah that whenever he came, he had no form that we should stare upon him. He didn't come down as Fabio. He didn't come down as a celebrity. He didn't come down as somebody that everyone is going to be gawking at and wanting to be looking like. He said he came down. He made himself of no reputation. He didn't even have a home. He said he had no place to even lay his head. This Jesus, this creator, this mighty God, this everlasting father, you have to get who's doing this. This isn't just some nice guy that's going and hanging out with homeless people. This isn't someone who's poor. We're talking about the everlasting God, the king, the, the Lord of all the universe, came down into what he created and took upon the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in the fashion of men, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death. So then, what is the mind of Christ? What is this mind that the Word of God wants us to have? And this found in these words, humbled himself and became obedient. Humbled himself and became obedient to what is the question? And so for the answer to that, we have to grasp that God, inside of all eternity, already had a plan to save you and to me. Before Adam and Eve took a, took a bite of that apple, we were in the heart of God. Because it says that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world in the book of Ephesians. So Jesus was already on that cro cross in the mind of God. And it says right here in Acts 2.26, I'm going to show you this. In two, uh, Acts 4.26-28. It says, the kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth, against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel predetermined before to be done. So here you see the whole earth raging against Jesus, against this man who, who humbled himself, who God came down in the creation you have King Herod, you have the Israel, you have the Gentiles, you have every person, you have every single person on the planet that's there besides the apostles turning on Jesus. Even Peter denied Jesus during this time. All the apostles scattered. The word of God says whenever they struck the shepherd, they all scattered, left Jesus by himself. This mighty God, this everlasting father, this prince of peace, didn't have to do this. What does it mean to humble yourself and become obedient? Whenever, whenever Jesus was told by his father what he must do, it wasn't a secret to Jesus how bad it was going to be. Whenever we look at the picture of the greatest picture in the Garden of Gethsemane, whenever Jesus is sitting there and he's so such anguish that he's sweating drops of blood because he knew what was on the other side of that that day he knew that he was going to be separated for the first time in all of eternity from his father that is that his father was going to turn his back on him that he was going to be in complete blackness and darkness and that the sin of the world was going to be put on him not to mention the plucking of his beard not to mention the beating of his skin till his flesh was exposed and his organs were exposed not not to mention all the mocking the, the crown of thorns this is the lord of glory this is the king of kings and he knew that he was about to be put to shame. But it says in Isaiah, it pleased the Lord to crush him. How did he get there? 
by the predetermined plan and will of God. For who? For us. For us. And so we see how high and exalted Christ is. Where do we compare on that scale? Nothing. Yet he made himself even lower than us. Is that not a picture of humility? Is that not? That's what it means. Humbled himself and became obedient even to the death on a cross. Is that this mighty God, this everlasting Father, this Prince of Peace, this pre-existent Jesus that made all things, died a horrible, horrifying death, was separated from the Father, bore the sin of the world for us, for the will of the Father, because he's always obedient to the will of the Father. So there's what I'm trying to draw out from this. Whenever Jesus was in the, in the garden, he said this, not my will, but thine will. So what can we learn from this? This is what it means for us to have the mind that Christ had. If we want to have the mind that Christ had, we have to look at the will of God. We have to look at the word of God and be willing to submit to it unto death. That's what Jesus did. That's the mind that he had. That's what, that's what we're supposed to draw from this when it says, let this mind be in you. We can't consider ourselves as greater than the word of God. Jesus didn't. And Jesus was equal with God. If anybody had a right to try to, to, try to um, defend themselves against God and say, well, I don't, I'm, I'm above that, it was Jesus. And he did none of that. He said he always obeyed the will of the Father. Never sinned once, not in thought or deed. Always loved the Father with all of his heart, his mind, his soul, and his strength. None of us in this room can claim that we've ever even done that for one second. But Jesus always did this. Right? This is the one that died for us. This is the one that's given us his picture of humility. And this is our example. We owe God everything. Jesus owed God nothing. And he was obedient. What is our excuse? Why, are, why do we find it so hard to submit to the word of God? And when God has shown us this kind of love. We're not even, we don't even have the same stance. As Jesus, we can't say where you are our equal. We can't even say that. <clears throat> so we must take cue and do just what Jesus did, humbled himself and became obedient. <clears throat> so in closing, I just want to give some examples here. This whole deal from Paul started. When Paul was talking about submitting to one another or to consider each other more important. It says, let nothing in, in uh, verse 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let us each esteem others better than ourselves. Look not every man unto his own things, but every man on the things of others. Okay, so here's the picture. Here's why, what Paul is trying to say. If Jesus was equal with God, and yet Jesus submitted to God, why can't you submit to each other? Why do you have to have your way? Why can't you make someone else more important than yourself? That's what Jesus is saying. He's, he's using an argument from the greater to the lesser. Jesus submitted, let this mind be in you. Consider each other more important than yourselves. And how do we do that? Well, Barlow goes out and does it when he goes out there in the street ministry. He has a Saturday night. He doesn't have to go out there. He doesn't have to go spend time with them people. But he didn't consider that beneath them. Just like Jesus doesn't consider it beneath him to come and die on a cross for us. This is how we renew our mind. When we take him, we look at Jesus and his example and just try to be like him. Other things. Uh, bless those that curse you. Pray for those that persecute you, right? Are we doing that? Or are we saying, that's beneath me? That person isn't worthy. I'm not going to submit to that. They don't, I, don't, I don't owe them that. What did Jesus owe God? He didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, yet fully in every single way submitted to the word of God and to the will of God as an example to us. Whenever Jesus says, you saw me hungry, you saw me, you saw me naked, you didn't invite me in. You didn't do this. You didn't do that for me. That's how we obey this. 
Right? Jesus didn't consider it robbery. He didn't say, well, they ain't worth my time. So why should we see another person in needs? The Bible says you see your man that needs the goods of the world. You don't help him. At the end of time, whenever it comes time to separate the sheep and the goats, you might think you're a Christian, but you ain't going the right way. You know, and this is why, because this is our example. If we truly believe this, this is the gospel. If we truly believe this. We truly believe that Jesus died according to the scriptures, according to God. That's what according to the scriptures mean, according to the word of God. He obeyed. Whenever it says unto us, a child is born, a child is given, that is the word of God. That's why Jesus came. Because God said, unto you a child will be born and a child will be given. He submitted that. Whenever it was time for him to show up, he showed up. Whenever it was time for him to meet the woman at the well, he said, I must needs pass this way. And went the long way. Why? Because God set an appointment for him. Every step that Jesus ever took was obedience to the Father. So why do we find it so hard to be obedient to the Father? We just have to look unto our author and finisher of our faith. Like it says up there. The author means that God wrote it in the Lamb's book of life. All that was planned before the foundation of the world for you and for me. It's all who will believe. That's the gospel. That's how we do these things. Not stirring up in a, in, a, in a love for that person, but in a love for God and what he's done for us. If we'll operate through that as our fuel for obedience, then it won't be that hard. Now, we all fall short. That's the truth. Uh, for the kids in here, are you always obedient to your parents? No. Word of God says that uh, people that do those things are deserving to die. That's that's the standard. <laughs> that's the standard. Uh, has anybody in here ever looked at something that wasn't yours and said, oh, I want that to be mine? Right? That's the standard death. That we have no hope apart from Christ and what he did. And he didn't have to do that. And he didn't have to do that. He didn't owe us that. He didn't look down and say, hey, look how great these people are. They're all doing the right thing. I better go help them out. He look, says he looked down from heaven and there was nothing good. None. Not even one. Not even one. All like sheep had went astray. We all went off the path. Yet even still, Christ came and climbed upon that cross. No man put him there, as Kevin always said. It was a complete act of humble submission and obedience. So that's what I'm here to ask us all to do more and more is let this mind be in you that's in Christ Jesus. Good word. Good word. Get my stuff opened up right quick. Got things falling out everywhere, man. It's crazy. I promise I was prepared somewhat anyway. Praise God. Uh, again, like I said earlier, whenever I introduced John, y'all just see where the connection is. We hadn't, we hadn't, we hadn't coordinated this or none of it, but I, it, I will make a minor connection, and that word is humble. Humble yourself because each and every one of us are eat up with pride, right? Because I'm going to do it my way, right? I'm going to do it how I want to do it, right? And even whenever we come into the church, you know, yeah, 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 I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to do it my way, right? And it, it, here's what's interesting, you know, and John, John mentioned uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, be not conformed to this world the way, the way this world tra trains us up, the way, you know, the public schools and even, even, the, even the curriculums for private schools and, and homeschooling and things of that nature. We're, we're raised up with a certain mentality, right? And they tried, kind of like, like common core math. They tried to instill common core math and get away from the traditional style of math, right? And, it, and it, it, I still don't understand that stuff. Right, but this is this is the this is the wisdom of the world. This is the knowledge of the world. And the scripture says, "Don't be conformed to this way. Be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed." That means metamorphi, which is metamorphosis, is where we get the word metam, you know metamorphosis. It, it means to become something else completely different. So, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And how do we do that? Through the Word of God. 
We've been given a model. There's not a, there's not a mystical, magical thing that happens within us that just, just magically appears one day. You know, whenever we profess Christ as our Savior, we've actually been given a model through the Word. We've actually been given a model through Jesus Christ to, to shape ourselves in. It's kind of like my son wanting to dress like his dad. Right? Yeah, he's, he's been given this model to, to esteem to, right? Because I'm not a, I'm not a bad dude. I, dress, I think I dress pretty good, right? But I've, been, I've given him a model of manhood, right? And he, and he, whether he wants to admit it or not, he, he esteems to the thir- certain things that I, that I have grasp of, right? And the Bible, the Word of God, Jesus Christ has, been, has, has given us that model to esteem to, Right in Second Peter chapter one, starting in verses five and six, it talks about now add to your faith virtue, and this is the stuff that we've been going over with on Monday nights in the Bible study is 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 the character of Christ and and the things that we can esteem to. We it's not something magical. It's not something you just it just happens one day. We've actually have something that we can that we can esteem to. Right, we have a model that works. That we can esteem too, you know. And for last this this last Monday night, we were going over the word temperance, which is self control, right? And the scripture, the, um, the Strong's Concordance says it's self control, self control, especially continence. Which I thought, whenever we were doing men's Bible study Monday night, I thought that that said continuance. And it didn't. It said countenance, C-O-N-T-I-N-E-N-C-E, countenance, 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 something like that. Right. So anyway, I had to look it up. Right. Long, long story short, I had to look it up. And it says it says for someone to refrain from something, especially sexual misconduct. It It not just. Just refraining from yourself, but especially from sexual misconduct or overeating or indulgence or, or things of that nature. Uh, it actually means to, to, to be strong in a thing, like masterful. How many of us are a master at a craft? What's your craft? Tattooing? Drawing? Art, art, artistry, right? We'll, we'll, we'll label it a different name. Heavy equipment. Right? Did you just walk up on the job one day and, 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 and know how to operate a cat? No. What's your craft? Deck hand. On a boat? You just don't roll up in there and, and the cabin say fire the engines up and you're like... You don't. Right? I'm a welder. I'm a welder. I, man, I can, I, I can weld up anything and a crack of dawn if given the opportunity. Right? But I didn't go into welding school knowing how to run a bead. It was something that I had to work at. It was something that I had to that I had to esteem to. It was something that I actually wanted to do. How many of us, you know, we, we, we had this idea going into college that we wanted to do one thing but wound up doing another thing because that one thing that we thought we wanted, we really didn't want. Right? <laughs> It's the same, it's the same thing. To be masterful in a thing is to actually work at it. It, it, to be strong in this thing means that you've got to exercise it out, right? You didn't get up underneath 400 or 500 pounds in squat just the first day out, did you? Me either. I don't think I ever got up underneath 400 pounds. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it actually comes from two different words, which is, which is in, E-N, and then kratos, uh, the primary preposition denoting a fixed position, right? So whenever we say that, we, that, that we're experiencing self-control, right, we're actually placing ourselves under something. We're actually placing ourselves under an authority of something, right? And then the, and the other word is uh, kratos, which means a dominion, might, or power, or strength. We're not just under this authority, but we're actually taking a stand in it. Right, it's, it's, whenever, whenever I say that I'm, I'm, I'm exhibiting self-control, I'm telling you, no, I'm not going to turn around. And just to show you that, I'm going to stand here and not turn around. But now I've got to turn around because my notes are behind me. 
I'm not going to fall short in sexual immorality. And I'm not going to do it. Whenever faced with the opportunity that would benefit me to tell a lie, even to my own detriment, I'm not going to tell a lie. I don't think it's any, I don't think it's an irony that, that in Second Peter chapter 1, it says, now add to your faith, which means that thing that you do, you're doing the Word of God. It says, add to your faith virtue, which is integrity, which is manliness. For you ladies, it means to, to do the right thing whenever nobody else is looking, right? But it also then goes to say, add to your virtue knowledge. So you have to have a knowing. Scripture tells us to study to show ourselves approved. To see that we're in the faith. Right? So we have to, we have, to have a knowledge of Christ. We have to have a knowledge of the Word. Not just, not just some idea of who He might be. Which, you know, and even in today's church, most will fall short of scrutiny of their faith in Christ when it lines up to the Word. Because they have an idea of Christ. They have a form of godliness, but neither deny the power thereof. So we've been given, we've been given several examples of what self-control is and what temperance is, right? And but the ones that I want to use, the ones that I want to use, let me back up. There's only two other times in the entirety of the Bible that temperance is used. In the, in the King James Version. I, haven't, I hadn't had the opportunity, or, nor have I taken the opportunity to study out any other, you know, because I'm just a King James guy. Uh, but there's only two other times, and they're all, they're, both of them are in the New Testament. And one of them is in Acts chapter 24, 25, whenever Paul is brought in front of Felix, right? And the Scripture says that Paul was ministering the righteousness of Christ, the temperance, and the judgment. To come, and the scripture says that Felix trembled. So, so if we're if we're talking about righteousness, which is the word of God, right? Being right in the eyes of God—that's what righteousness means. And the only way that we can be right with God is through God's word, right? And it says temperance, which is self-control, which he's ministering to to an authority of a governing body of a country or a nation that 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 is known for the ex sexual immorality the 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 if i'm not mistaken and i could be wrong but i heard that the first the first diagnosis of diabetes was through the roman empire because of the gluttony of eating so much honey Y'all y'all can look me up, check me on that, I'm, I'm, and I'm not really sure, but from my, from, if I remember correctly. But even then, gluttony was, was an issue with the Roman Empire. Sexual immorality was an issue with the Roman Empire. Uh, 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 Overexerting your authority or your power was an issue with the Roman Empire. But even then, it says... Righteousness, temperance, and judgment. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, this is all part of the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Temperance is a part of the fruit of the Spirit, which is something that, something that following, following the Word of God comes out of you. This is, this is not something that, is, that, that can be contained. Right? If it's truly in you, it's going to come out of you. Right? You are what you eat. Make sense? So the two, the, the, the example, the example of ex exercising temperance can be found in King David, right? Whenever, whenever Saul was seeking to kill him, right? In first Samuel, uh, in first Samuel chapter 24, let's go there. And I'm going to read real quick. Starting in verse 1, it says, And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told to him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen to seek David, chosen men out of all of Israel, and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coat by the way, 
where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet, which means take a nap. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. In the sides of the cave. Check this out. You want to, fate has it. It just so happens to be this way right now. You know, kind of like John was saying, man, I think the, the steps were ordered. Right? Saul is seeking to kill David. David and his wayward men are in a cave, hiding in a cave. And it just so happens, it just so happens that Saul winds up taking a nap in that same cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Man, the Lord done blessed you, David. The Lord done blessed you. He, he put your enemy right in front of you. Man, and he don't even know you're there. The perfect opportunity to go on and clear all this mess up, man, and go on and take the throne. This is, this is, the Lord provided for you. This is, what David, this is what the men are talking to David about. Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately. He didn't want to lay hands on, on, on God's anointed. So he snuck in there where Saul was at. He cut a part of his robe off. And took it back until Saul left. I ain't going to say that. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him. Because he had cut off Saul's skirt. <laughs> he felt bad even doing that. He felt bad doing that. I'm, man, come on now. He felt bad. So, so there was so much, so much self-control over him that whenever he even violated just a little bit of it, just, just a smidgen of it, he, all he did was cut off just a sliver. And even then it convicted him. It, it was like, ah, I shouldn't have even done that. Too many times whenever we're given the opportunity to jack something up, guess what, man? We're going to jack it up full force. I don't, just, I don't just get mad at a traffic stop, man. I actually stop the guy, get out and invite him to the side of the road so I can instruct him on how to drive. With every intent of hoping he'll say something so I can bust him in the mouth. The only thing that I controlled that day was my foul language. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with their, these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. What's interesting about this here is later on in this, in this chapter, Saul left, and as he was going down the mountain, David come out of that same cave and held up the ribbon in his hand and said, Saul, King Saul, why? I had the opportunity to kill you. Why are you after me? Why are you after me? Why do you hate me so much? So we can go to chapter 18, 1 Samuel chapter 18. And men in the, in, in the home understand that on the way home Monday evening, I always ask my son, what did you get out of it? And I didn't realize it, but he was sitting over here in, verse, in chapter 18, and he kept reading even past the scriptures that, that we had even studied on. And uh, it was so Dad, I, you know, I, I was reading. I, I'm sorry, but I wasn't really paying attention, but I was reading on. And it said that King Saul, you know, and he, he, he went in. And I'm like, all right, let's see, let's see what you got here. So in verse 6 through 15, whenever they come in, whenever King Saul came in, and up to this point, David was Jonathan's best friend. 
And, and Saul loved David because he played the harp. Right? And whenever he, whenever he killed Goliath, whenever, whenever they defeated the Philistines and they were coming in, the women of all the different cities of Jerusalem or Israel came in and they were singing songs about Saul and David, talking about King Saul kills a thousand and David kills tens of thousands. And the scripture says that Saul was wroth. He was mad. He was mad as a hornet. There are going to be times whenever we're going to stand on what the Word of God says. We're going to stand on what the Word of God says. Look, man, it tells me, I love you, bro. Uh, man, I want to go celebrate your birthday with you. I want to do all this other stuff, man. But the Scripture tells me that the drunkard shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So, I'm, I, man, I can't go out and drink with you, man. Oh, come on, man. That ain't nothing but a bunch of garbage. You know what? The Word says, you're going, to, you're, you're going to become against for taking a stand for, for what the Word of God says whenever you take a stand for what the Word of God says. The, you, you, people are going to despise you. People are going to hate you. Pe David killed Goliath. David was the only one that had enough uh, 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 fortitude about himself to step out in the field against Goliath, the giant. And not only that, the, five, the four other stones that he had in his pouch... He had already seen that he had four other kinfolk out in the out in the main out in the out in the bunch. There were five giants in the Philistine army. Goliath just so happened to be the oldest brother of them all, or the father of them. But the reason why he stepped out. The reason why he shucked off the, 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 the armor of Saul and all this other stuff is because he had an understanding of the covenant between God and Israel. He had the understanding. And how we know that is because whenever he got out there and says, Do y'all not hear this uncircumcised Philistine? He already knew that they were in covenant and they weren't. So whenever you stand, now you've put yourself on center stage. Right? Whenever we, whenever we take a stand for the things of God, we're putting ourselves on center stage with all the unbelievers around us. They're going to come against you. They're going to get mad because of the decisions that you make. Right? What are some other, what are some other things that, that would come out of somebody? And that, and what, what other emotions or what other, what other things might come out of somebody? Saul was mad. Scripture goes on and says that he's, he was in fear. There was two different words, two different fears used in this in this scripture. Right? The first one was actually literally meant fear. The other one says dreaded. Couldn't even stand to be around David, man. Didn't want to. He sent him out to the armies because he couldn't kill him because David dodged two javelin throws. So he sent him out and couldn't even stand around. How about jealousy? Somebody going to be jealous because you actually got the fortitude to take a stand and they don't? How about embarrassment? How many times have we been in a conversation with somebody, right? And, and because we're taking a stand on the things, of the, on, on what the Word of God said. Had a conversation with somebody. My job as a father is to prepare my children to be godly men and women. To save themselves from marriage. Right? Co-worker of mine. You know what his job was as a father? To make sure she was the best lover for her husband. So whenever we have these conversations, how south do you think they go? Saul was very wroth. Saul was afraid because God was with David. Saul dreaded to be around David, was the other interpretation of the word fear. David conducted himself wisely in all his ways. Whenever you conduct yourself wisely in all your ways, which means you have to, you have to master this, you have, to, you have to stand on the things of God, right? It's going to be a manifestation in your life. Does this make sense? So let's go on to, uh, so jealousy, intimidation, 
How many times, have Darren, or Derek, have you been in a conversation with somebody and just because of your knowledge of God, it, it caused intimidation with that person? More than once. Fear, anger, disdain, can't even stand to be around you. Shame. Matthew 10, and Luke 21, 17 both said, but they hate you for my name's sake. They're going to hate you whenever you take a stand for the things of God and for the rest of the story. Genuine Paul Harvey. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. So we've, we've shared a, we've shared a uh, description of what, what temperance actually looks like. Whenever you have the opportunity to, to, to make the wrong decisions, it's all about making the right decisions. Uh, we, can, we can reflect back to King David in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And that is the red one. And it came to pass after, starting in verse 1, and it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth for battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him. And he laid with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned unto her house, and the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Back to Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. It says, now add to your virtue knowledge. So we're going to, we're, we're going to have an understanding of, of, of things Right? That not, not any of the other people in the world have. Scripture says that David, in the time that kings war against kings, stayed at home. Which tells me that David wasn't where he was supposed to be in the first place. I can attest for being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Three times. But I can also attest that in that three times, all three times, I had the opportunity. Scripture says that he'll make a way for us to get out, right? I had the opportunity three different times, right, to change the course of my life. And I made the wrong decisions that directed the course of my life, right? Three different times, the reason why I didn't exude temperance or self-control, right, is because I was intimidated, Or because I was scared of some, what somebody else might think of me. Right? Or any, any, any of an other litany of, of, of words or emotions that we can have. Right? The big one for me, I was just a coward. And what was shameful about that was the first two times, the first two times it took place were practically in the same time. And I knew from that experience, whenever I went into the third experience and still made that piss poor choice, bad choice. I wasn't where I was supposed to be in the first place. David wasn't where he was at to be in the first place. Right? It says, and he tarried. Which he wasn't, the scripture tells us that we need to be diligent. And he tarried, which opens up the avenue, which opens up the avenue for, for, for lackadaisicalness or, or a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 
David wasn't where he was supposed to be. David tarried or relaxed, which is what that word means. He dropped his guard. He dropped his guard. More so than not. How many of us think that whenever we, for me, I stopped smoking and went to dipping whenever Shalem was born because I thought that dipping would, would, would not harm anybody else until she was two and three years old walking around grabbing hold of my Coca-Cola bottles, drinking my spit. <laughs> our lack of self-control our lack of being strong in a thing doesn't just affect us right whenever we whenever we put a, how much would it affect my youth if they were to see me down at Chili's drinking at the bar What's interesting is, and we're going to get into this in a minute. What's interesting is, in Titus chapter 1, and I'll close with this. Where are we at on time? Yeah, we can go ahead and work towards that direction. What's interesting about all this is that Titus chapter 1 verse 15 says, Unto the pure all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. So even, even if I have sin in my life, I'm just going to use me as an example, right? I'm a youth pastor. I'm an associate pastor for a church, right? I raise up our next generation or, or help to raise up our next generation in the things of God. For some of them, they don't even know anything about God until they come here. Right? Even if I never get busted in sexual, sexual immorality, or even if I never get caught drinking at Chili's, or even if I never, never get caught looking at porn, or any of this, any of it, if I never get caught, I am the master, I am the master of cover-up. If none of this is on display or ever gotten caught, right? Even to the defiled, nothing is pure. But everything, even their mind and conscience is skewed. Even in all that, if I have sin living in my life, if I have sin living in my life, even whenever I go to minister to somebody, it's going to be off. It's going to, it's going to be just a click. If I'm really, really good, it's only going to be a half click. But even then, whenever we look at the trajectory a mile down the road, we're going to, we're going to miss the mark. So whenever we talk about our self-control, whenever we talk about having that model, whenever we humbling ourselves to allow the Word of God to change us, even then, and I, and I correct myself on this, even then, it's not something that's just magically going to happen. It's something that we have to strive towards. He's given us a model. He's given us a model of His character. He's given us a model of, 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 of what we are to look like. How we are supposed to act. And we're not going to do it living in pride. We're not going to do it living in our own understanding. It's not going to happen. Y'all stand up.